I get the question all the time. Should I pay off my mortgage or keep the money invested? I had a client pay off a 2.8% fixed rate mortgage and they loved it. So here's the current reality. If you were to go buy a home today, interest rates are much higher. So giving up that low fixed rate interest under 3%, well, let's just say there are lots of opinions. What I would tell you to do is based on what we've taught all these years is I would take 65,000, throw it at your house. No wonder people have questions about paying off a mortgage early. So I'm going to go through the same analysis I went through with Joe and Sandy. We'll take a look at the math and we'll also discuss how their personal preferences affected their decision. You'll be able to use this framework for your decision. Oh, and this is important too. I also want to show you which account they withdrew their money from to make the payoff. This actually had a big effect on their decision because if this account was not available to them, it would have changed the analysis quite a bit. And if you get something out of this video, could you click that like button and consider subscribing if you want to take the retirement journey with us. Going back to this mortgage rate chart, you can see that rates were low for a very long time. And if you've had a mortgage for at least several years, hopefully you refinanced and locked in a low fixed rate, perhaps under 3%. What's crazy is if, if you sold your home and just moved down the street with the new mortgage, you could be paying more than double the interest. This is why we see limited inventory of homes for sale. I mean, people understandably just don't want to get rid of a mortgage that's just a great deal by today's standards. The math says if you can pay interest at a lower amount than you can earn interest, you're going to be net positive. Now, even before rates went up, retirees were faced with this decision. You could keep your money in stocks and hope to earn more than your mortgage rate, but you do have to be comfortable with that high reward, high risk trade-off. A big downturn in the stock market, especially early in retirement, could leave you with a dented investment portfolio and still have a mortgage to pay off. But here's what's changed. Interest rates, yes, have increased for mortgages, but they've also increased for the return you can receive on conservative investments like CDs, treasury bills, or money market funds. So let's say instead of paying off your 3% mortgage, you set aside that money earning 5% interest. Well, even after taxes, you could very well come out ahead. Plus you have the money in your possession. That money would be more accessible in your own account than locked up as equity in your house. The bottom line is you have the option to pay off that mortgage at any time if that money remains liquid and if you're earning that risk-free interest. But once the mortgage is paid, if you have any need for the equity as cash, like if an emergency came up or if you have long-term healthcare needs, you would need to access it through an equity line of credit, which can have its own fees and minor inconveniences. And banks don't need to offer a credit line like when they stopped issuing credit in 2008. So there's no guarantee there. Some people choose reverse mortgages for these needs, but there's a lot to think about if you go down that road. For Joe and Sandy, they tend to be conservative by nature. Their cash and conservative bonds were yielding around 5%. They understood that interest rates could also drop. I mean, this did happen back in 2008 during the great financial crisis. Interest rates plummeted with treasury bills averaging 1.37% after previously returning 4.36% in 2007. And then from 2009 on down, interest rates dropped like a rock. For them, squeaking out a slightly higher interest rate after taxes was less appealing than just having the mortgage paid off. I mentioned that it was important for Joe and Sandy where they withdrew the money and how the analysis could be different if they were forced to withdraw from another account. And this will be important as you look at your own accounts. Joe and Sandy needed $197,000 to pay off the mortgage. They had $176,000 in cash, mostly treasury bills and high interest savings account. They could afford to part with $100,000. But before I tell you where they withdrew the other $97,000 to pay off the mortgage, let me explain why they chose to only take $100,000 from savings. They still wanted to keep a healthy cash reserve. So with $100,000 committed to the payoff, they still had 76,000 left in the bank, which was a solid cash reserve by most standards, but lower than they typically liked. Two things, however, made it work for them. Number one, since their cash was being used to pay off a mortgage and reduce a major payment, they're okay with going a little lower on cash. And two, we agreed that they could take what they were paying toward the mortgage each month and rebuild up their cash reserves to a comfortable point. After dedicating this cash that still left them with 97,000 that they needed for the mortgage payoff. For this, we withdrew from a brokerage account, a non-retirement plan. They had 937,000 in that investment account with an allocation of about 60% stocks for long-term growth 
and 40% in bonds and cash, which is $375,000 in dollar terms. We agreed that since paying off the mortgage was a conservative decision with their money, they should take the 97,000 that they needed from the bonds and cash and leave the stocks as they are for long-term growth. This would also help them avoid paying significant capital gains by selling their stocks, which had grown quite a bit over time. After the withdrawal in their investment account, they still had 278,000 in bonds and cash, or 33% of the remaining 840,000 in the brokerage account, still a healthy cushion, especially with no debt and manageable expenses. Now this could have been very different. I've seen where people pay off their mortgage with every last dime and then have no flexibility. The decision to pay off their mortgage worked for Joe and Sandy because they not only had the cash to pay off their mortgage, but they didn't leave themselves empty on cash. I've also seen where people want to pay off their mortgage by withdrawing large taxable amounts from their retirement accounts. For example, for someone earning $100,000 of current income and then adding $200,000 from an IRA withdrawal, that could increase a retiree's tax bracket significantly. And this example from 31% to 44%, including our wonderful California taxes. The better solution if you have to draw from retirement accounts, if you really feel compelled to pay extra toward your mortgage from an IRA, is incrementally draw a little more each month from that IRA, spread out the tax over several years, and just pay down that mortgage faster. This can help limit jumping up tax brackets but please make sure to talk with your tax and financial advisors about how that may work for you. Now, if you've done well to save money in a Roth IRA, you might say, well, that's all tax free when it comes out in retirement. So I might as well use that to pay off the mortgage. But I would caution you on that because Roth IRAs really are so powerful. All that growth is tax free if you follow the tax laws. So the real power is allowing that Roth IRA to grow and then using it very strategically throughout retirement to minimize your taxes. Joe and Sandy loved their decision to pay off their mortgage in retirement. I get it. Could they have earned a little more with T-bills or CDs? Yeah, probably. Not everyone would want to give up a low fixed rate mortgage. That's valid too. But for them, they had the cash to withdraw that would not result in big taxes. They were not giving up on their growth investments and netting slightly higher interest after taxes just was not as appealing as being completely debt-free and sleeping easier at night. For you, I hope that you've seen what you need to factor into your personal decision, but remember not to make massive decisions like this independently. Consider your whole financial plan. In this video, my partner Alex walks through a real financial plan for a couple age 67 with 2.5 million, aiming to live on 100K a year, Alex will see you over on that video now. Once again, this is Anthony Saffer, CEO and financial advisor here at One Degree Advisors. And if you're interested in learning more how we help our clients gain confidence in their retirement, visit our website at onedegreeadvisors.com.